Hi everyone, and thank you for joining us for this introduction to the science of process safety. Over the course of the next 20 minutes, we will cover four distinct topics. These topics will include dispersion models, how to model and plan for toxic release, toxicology, how much is too much, fire and explosions, creation and consequences, and industrial hygiene, purpose and components. This presentation was brought to you by Toxicologists Incorporated and the Blevy Foundation. Whenever there's an accident in a chemical plant, there's always the potential hazard for toxic vapor being released and forming a cloud that would not only affect the plant, but could spread and harm the surrounding areas. Dispersion models are a way to help predict how these toxic clouds would move and spread. Some factors that kind of form the dispersion models are wind speed, which would account for how quickly the toxic cloud moves, atmospheric stability, which affects the uh, vertical mixing or whether the toxic cloud would tend to rise or sink, the surrounding conditions, if there's buildings, there tends to be more mixing and more spreading of the toxic cloud, but if it's over a lake, the cloud would tend to stay together. The force of release can also affect how quickly the toxic cloud moves and disperses. The height of release is also um, something to look at because if it's released from a higher point then the concentration of that toxic cloud at the ground is going to be lower than if it was released at the ground. And another factor is the physical conditions, you know, whether the gas is more dense or less dense than air. If it's less dense, it will tend to, you know, rise and if it's more dense, it'll tend to sink to the ground. When these factors are put together in the dispersion model, they're used to help calculate concentrations in various locations. So maybe at the release point or around the plant site or in a local community a mile away. They can help you determine how severe the release is, you know, whether there's going to be a huge concentration and it could help you decide if the area needs to be evacuated and if so, how big of an area needs to be evacuated. And if an area needs to be evacuated, the dispersion model in these factors can help you determine how long people might have, you know, before the concentrations or the damage to them is too severe. And the vapor cloud could also be flammable depending on the physical conditions, which could prevent even more harm and more hazard and increase the severity of the release. By understanding the model, one can help create an inherently safe design. So for example, by positioning the plants miles away from a local community, if you know you're working with extremely hazardous and dangerous materials. Whether or not to contain a process, you know, if the material released could potentially create a flammable mixture, then you wouldn't want to contain it. You would want to release it to the atmosphere. But if it's a toxic vapor that's not flammable, you would want to contain it. Another thing is the amount of chemical stored. Less material limits the magnitude of a worst case scenario and helps prevent the damage done. You can add alarms to help for early detection because there's never a 100% way to prevent these disasters. And another thing is that you can develop a safety plan in advance to help not only the plant, but also the community around you. Our next section is Toxicology 101. A fundamental principle of toxicology is there are no harmless substances, only harmless ways of using substances. So how much is too much? Stay tuned for this short message brought to you by Toxicologists Incorporated. Do you ever wonder how much is too much when it comes to studying or drinking coffee or exercising? When do you know your limit or do you just keep going?
But not to worry, that's where Toxicologist Incorporated comes in. Toxicologists at Tox Inc. are here to answer the big question. How much is too much? So next time you are questioning your limits, like Miguel here, suffering from overcaffeination, or Hattie, suffering from exhaustion, call 1-800-TOXICATED. All new customers will get a free dose response curve. Thank you. Toxicology is the study of adverse effects of chemical, biological, or physical agents on living organisms in the environment. As we've seen, toxicologists are here to develop methods to determine harmful effects, the dosages that cause those effects, and safe exposure limits. Toxicologists know how much is too much. In the chemical process industry, there are a large amount and a variety of chemicals, so chem chemical engineers must know exposure routes, elimination routes, health and environmental effects, and methods to reduce or prevent exposure to these substances. Toxicants enter biological organisms by the following routes. Ingestion, inhalation, injection, and dermal absorption. All these routes can be controlled by the application of proper industrial hygiene techniques summarized in the table here. Of the four routes of entry, the inhalation and dermal routes are the most significant in industrial facilities. Figure 2.1 shows the expected blood level concentration as a function of time and route of entry. Blood level concentration is affected by many parameters, which is the reason for the large variation in the curves. Injection usually results in the highest blood level concentration, followed by inhalation, ingestion, and absorption. Table 2.2 lists some of the effects or responses from toxic exposure. The problem is to determine whether exposure has occurred before substantial sim symptoms are present. This is accomplished through a variety of medical tests. The results are then compared to a medical baseline study performed before exposure. Chemical companies often perform baseline studies on new employees before employment. To quantify the effects of the suspect toxicant on a target organism, toxicological studies are performed. Toxicological studies are mostly performed on animals with the hopes that the results can be extrapolated to humans. Before undertaking a, toxolog a toxicological study, some important things must be identified. These include identifying the toxicant, identifying the target, such as an organism, organ, or the environment, identifying the effect or response that is to be tested. This can be acute effects, death, illness, or chronic effects, identifying the dose range, and identifying the period of the test. Biological organisms respond differently to the same dose of toxicant. One of toxicology's most basic principles is the dose makes the poison. Differences in responses are a result of a number of factors. Consider a toxicological test run in a large number of individuals. Each individual is exposed to the same dose and the response is plotted. Curves of this form are frequently represented by a Gaussian distribution as shown on the curve on the far left. The experiment can then be repeated for a number of different doses and curves similar to the first graph on the left are drawn. The standard deviation and mean response are then determined for each dose and the cumulative mean response at each dose is plotted as shown by the middle graph. A complete dose response curve is plotted versus the low logarithm of the dose, as shown on the far right. This form provides a much straighter line in the middle of the response curve than the simple response versus dose form in the middle. Response dose curves are developed using acute toxicity data. If the response of interest is death or lethality, the response versus dose curve is called a lethal dose curve. For comparison purposes, the dose that results in 50% deaths of the subject is often reported and is known as the LD50 dose. Many methods exist for representing the response dose curve. For a single exposure, the probit or probability unit is well suited as it provides a straight line equivalent to the response dose curve. The method was developed by Trester Bliss in 1934 and nowadays remains useful because most old data is recorded in probits. Another advantage of the probit analysis is it allows for statistical interpretation of different effects of the same drug. For example, as shown in the graph here, probit analysis allows for the ED50, TD50, and LD50 to be compared. The threshold limit values, or TLVs, refer to airborne concentrations that correspond to conditions under which no adverse effects are normally expected during a worker's lifetime. The expo exposure occurs only during normal working hours, eight hours per day and five days per week. There are three types, the TLV, TWA, or the time-weighted average concentration based on an 8-hour workday and 40-hour work week to which workers can be repeatedly exposed without adverse effects, 
the TLV STEL or the threshold limit value short term exposure limit, 15 minute TWA exposures that should not be exceeded at any time during the workday, and the TLVC, the threshold limit value ceiling, concentration that should never be exceeded. Finally, toxicants are eliminated by excretion through the kidneys, liver, lungs, or other organisms. Detoxification, when the body changes chemicals into something less harmful through biotransformation or storage in fatty tissues. Methods to prevent or reduce entry of toxicants into biological organisms are considered in industrial hygiene, which will be talked about next. However, when in doubt, always call 1-800-INTOXICATED. Now let's move on to the fire and explosion section of this video. Let's start with the fire triangle. You need three elements to have a fire or explosion. The first is fuel, such as gasoline, wood dust, or hydrogen gas. The second thing you need is an oxidizer or source of oxygen, such as nitric acid or ammonium nitrate. The third thing you need is an ignition source. This can be from electrical equipment or smoking, for example. All three things must be present in order to have an explosion or fire. Let's talk about the differences between fires and explosions. The major distinction between fires and explosions is the rate of energy release. Fires typically release energy slowly, whereas explosions tend to release energy rapidly, typically on the order of microseconds. Fires can result from explosions, and explosions can also result from fires. Now we're on to flash points and flammability limits. The flash point of a liquid is the lowest temperature at which it gives off enough vapor to form an ignitable mixture with air. At the flash point, the vapor will burn, but only briefly. Inadequate vapor is produced to maintain combustion. The flash point generally increases with increasing pressure. The flammability limits are concentrations of vapor-air mixtures that will initiate in combustion, and they are typically given in percent. The lower flammability limit is the lowest concentration of vapor that will allow combustion. Any lower and the mixture will have too much oxygen and be considered lean. The upper flammability limit is the highest concentration of vapor that will allow for combustion. Any higher and there will be too much fuel and the mixture will be considered rich. The range of flammability limits typically increases with increasing temperature. Fires and explosions can be prevented by the process of inerting. Since oxygen is the key ingredient in combustion, its concentration can be reduced to prevent the propagation of flame, regardless of the concentration of fuel. The process of lowering the oxygen concentration by adding an inert gas such as nitrogen is called inerting. This removes the oxygen component from the flame triangle and prevents combustion from occurring. Under the right circumstances, a mixture of flammable vapors can auto-ignite. The auto-ignition temperature is the temperature at which a vapor will spontaneously ignite due to the energy of its surroundings. Auto-ignition does not require an ignition source. Flammable mixtures outside of the flammability limits increase the auto-ignition temperature. As pressure increases, the auto-ignition temperature decreases. Another concept in fires and explosions is adiabatic compression. When a vapor is compressed, its temperature will increase. When its temperature increases to that above the auto-ignition temperature, the mixture will ignite. This is exactly how a diesel engine functions, and a video is shown to the right. Now let's talk about ignition sources. Ignition sources are one of the elements of the fire triangle, so removing that element can prevent the occurrence of a fire or explosion. Ignition sources are very numerous, so it is impossible to eliminate them all. Some of the major ignition sources include electrical wiring of motors, smoking, friction from bearings or broken parts, and overheated material or hot surfaces.
Moving on to the different types of explosion propagation, there are two, detonation and deflagration. Detonation includes a strong pressure wave, which forces the mixture in front of the wave to above its auto-ignition temperature. As a result, detonations propagate at the speed of sound. Deflagrations, on the other hand, propagate at below the speed of sound. How severe can blast damage be? Blast waves from explosions cause an overpressure. Even small overpressures can cause severe structural damage. Just 0.15 PSIG overpressure will shatter glass windows. 2 to 3 PSIG will destroy almost all unreinforced walls. 10 PSIG and above will completely destroy structures. Please stay tuned for a few words from our sponsors, the Blevy Foundation. I'm a tank of propane. Your dad put me too close to the campfire. Well, that's a problem cause. Now I'm starting to boil and the pressure is rising. Now this tank is compromised. Whoopsies. I'm about to be a boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion. And if you've got cut rate insurance, you could be paying for this yourself. So talk to the Blevy Foundation. You can save money and be better protected from mayhem like me. Dollar for dollar, nobody protects you from danger like the Blevy Foundation. Give us a call at 1-800-NO-BLEVY for free consultation. We believe in protecting your interests. Hi, I'm Miguel and the process safety topic I will be covering today is industrial hygiene. Let's begin by asking what is the purpose of industrial hygiene? Well, industrial hygiene deals with protecting workers from hazardous conditions at the workplace. In other words, industrial hygiene is all about promoting safety. Workers are more likely to enjoy a healthy lifestyle when the situations that could pose a threat to human life are minimized or eliminated. The four components of industrial hygiene are anticipation, identification, evaluation, and control. I will explain how the four phases of industrial hygiene can be applied to something most people do on an everyday basis, driving. Anticipation phase. This is a stage where we start thinking about what might happen in the future. We realize that there is always a possibility of encountering hazards and obstacles as we drive from point A to point B. In this case, we decide to leave 15 minutes earlier, just in case something happens. Identification phase. While driving on the freeway, we look for clues that indicate something is not right. We scan the road ahead to look out for stranded vehicles, flooded areas, lane closures, wrecks, and unusual objects such as, that's right, abandoned couches. For the evaluation phase, we look at the extent of the danger of a situation. In this example, say we run into a traffic accident involving the spill of a hazardous substance. As we approach the site of the accident, a radio announcement comes on saying that an overturned truck is releasing enough of a substance to reach an ERPG3 concentration of 25 ppm that corresponds to a distance of 200 meters. Next comes the control phase. It is time to act. In this stage, we go about finding solutions and making changes in response to an unsafe situation. Start by making adjustments such as reducing speed and maintaining a safe driving distance to avoid collisions with nearby vehicles. Also, switching over to a different lane and eventually exiting the road to take a different route will help us stay away from the hazardous situation. Great! We saw how the foundations of industrial hygiene can help us better anticipate and react to a dangerous situation. Summarized, industrial hygiene sends the message that safety really is a priority. Thank you for watching. This presentation was created by a group of members, including Hattie Shunk, Deborah Albus, Travis Tarleton, Russell Ward, and Miguel Padrone. Once again, a special thanks to Toxicologists Incorporated and the Blevy Foundation. This video was created as a component of Process Safety Chemi 4356 
and is submitted as a project component of the course.